didn't introduce myself last time. I apologize for that. I'm Jared Atchison, director of Bandwick Forks. I also sat in your very seats years ago and it's a camper at this workshop and now I'm excited to come back and get to talk to you. So this is the first time I've given this lecture, so I'll be looking forward to whatever feedback you have afterwards. I'll be excited to get in here uh, if you thought it was worthwhile or not, or what parts of it we should change or not. So this lecture came uh, as a result of a massive uh, community conversation that was taking place at College of Bay last year. Uh, and it helped me by virtue of a conversation with Dr. Scott Harris who's the director of Native Kansas, come to what I think are the two maxims of debate. Number one, debate is always changing. Number two, the change is in large part a result of what the students want to do. How many of you in this room last year debated the affirmative that did not defend the United States federal government action? If we had asked that same question when I was a camper here, it would have been absurd. It would have been asserted in a variety of levels. It would have been absurd to think someone would try. It would be absurd to think someone could win. It would be absurd to think someone could win enough that other people would want to do it. What's weird about the debate community is we are in a constant state of change. It doesn't mean that the pace of change is the same for always. Sometimes the change is occurring at a more micro level, like changes within arguments or changes within what two and R's can and cannot go for, or changes within the number of theoretical objections you can get away with. Those types of changes are the more macro level. Sometimes, however, those changes occur at the very question of what the heck we're doing together. And I think that I can safely say you are in the middle of a conversation about what is debate supposed to be about. Now, what's weird about that is you're entering the conversation after it has occurred and before it is finished. And it may be the case that if you all debate four years in high school and four years in college, it still won't be decided in the eight years that you're a part of debate. Now, some people may look on that and say, that's a terrible tragedy. I'll never have a year of complete and total stability. I'll never know going into a season what an entire year of debates will feel like, look like, be like. For others of you, that's an incredibly awesome thing because that means you people in this room will change the debate you you will have a greater impact on the future of what we call debate than I will. If I stopped doing debate workshops next summer, if I left being a director of debate at Wake Forest next summer, within four years, no one would know who Jared Atchison is. That's the way the debate community works. We are a transient community. We just don't remember who people were. But if someone in this room were able to change debate by winning a significant number of debates on a particular argument that was different than the way we do it now, if enough other of your colleagues at critical mass latched onto that and said, hey, that one, I'd like to try that as well, or I just believe that argument, that was pretty persuasive, I want to make it as well, that could change the debate community to echo for generations after that. In large part, I think, what we're trying to talk about today then is what the hell is the role of the resolution. So to do that, we're going to start by talking about stasis theory. This is a concept from argumentation studies. It's pretty simple. It comes from the Greek to stand still, and this is the point of departure that the debate centers on. So, if I said out loud, I'm a San Antonio Spurs fan. Okay? The people clapping, we don't have a point of departure. The people clapping with me are also San Antonio Spurs fans. Is anyone here not a San Antonio Spurs fan? Okay, good. Uh, Matt, what are you a fan of? He's a Lakers fan. Okay. As of this moment, we still don't really have a point of departure. All we know is two interesting things about our team. I like Spurs. He likes the Lakers. What if the big resolutional question was, what conference, the Western and Eastern, Eastern Conference is better? He and I are now on the same side again. Does that make sense? Because both those teams play in the West. So the point of departure is the moment in argumentation studies where you actually have the formula and the foundation for a debate to occur. Now, you can have a point of departure anytime. You can meet somebody on the street. They're wearing a Lakers shirt, you're wearing a Spurs shirt, and you walk up and I can say, Tim Duncan is better than Kobe Bryant. Do it. At that moment, if the person chooses to defend Kobe Bryant, we found our point of stasis. We are now arguing about whether or not Tim Duncan is better than Kobe Bryant. We didn't need a resolution. We didn't need anything written down. We didn't need anybody else to tell us that was it. That's what the point was going to be. But what if I walked into the person with the Lakers shirt and said, Tim Duncan is better than Kobe Bryant, and they said, yeah, you're right. 
But I think the Lakers are the best franchise. Here's why. They've now shifted the question. Now the debate isn't Kobe versus Tim Duncan. Now it's which franchise is more important. I can then choose to engage and say, I agree, you're right, the Lakers are the better franchise. Or I can say, no, that's not true. And now we have a new 26. Does everybody see how this works? Very simple concept, not all that complicated, but you all are fighting about this round in and round out. The basic argument goes like this. If you don't attempt to find the point of stasis, if you don't attempt to argue from the point of stasis, if you don't attempt in any way, shape, or form to find a commonality that you will argue about, you're either working through discussion groups, which have no need to necessarily find the point of stasis, because there's a goal, right? A discussion group is generally designed around having a topic to be discussed, or you're the Oratory champion like Jimmy was in 2013 in NFL. You're just delivering powerful, interesting speeches that aren't necessarily in any way, shape, or form in contrast with each other. So for it to transition from either a discussion group or to transition it from a simple oratory contest, there has to be a point of stasis. Now, when we decide on the point of stasis, this is where the controversy begins. So let's start transitioning then to the role of timing. If I meet you one year from today in this room and I tell everyone in one year from today we are going to have a debate on the affirmative you will defend that summer debate workshops are bad for the activity. On the negative you will defend that's not in fact the case. You will defend that summer debate workshops are good for the debate activity. You have an entire year to prepare. I will see you in one year. We agree on the resolution. There's no like weirdness about the words. We're all on the same page. Why is that debate different than if I just said to you right now in this room at this moment, go, I think some debate workshops are bad and defend it. Why is the timing matter? Somebody, anybody. Yeah. Okay, the question of preparedness, yeah. A lot can change between now and a year from now, exactly, right? What else? Okay, Matt says he couldn't predict, but Matt, you're at a debate workshop. Why can't you defend that you are at a debate workshop? You made a decision to come to one. Surely you can defend that you're here, right? You didn't think about all the reasons why you came? You didn't think about whether or not it was good for your long-term mental health? You didn't think about whether or not it was good for your chances of being better at debate? You didn't think about any of that? You did think about that, so you're prepared to defend it. All right, how many of you can not see a debate that goes down just like this? Where someone says, I want to have a debate about the debate community. And the other person says, I'm not ready to have that debate. And the response is, but you're in it. You're choosing to do things in the debate community. You are performing a particular style. You are choosing a particular set of arguments. And you're not prepared to defend why you do that? The ethos challenge I'm making in that moment is very similar to the question of, just because you're doing something, are you prepared to defend it? Maybe, maybe not. But the point of stasis is what's really up for debate. If you said to that person, in a year, if you told me we will have a debate, or in a month, or in a week, or in a day, we're going to have a debate about whether or not this particular debate practice is good or bad or not, I'd be ready for debate. But doing it right now on the spot, I'm less prepared. All right, so what we're then essentially trying to talk about is when do we come up with a point of stasis, and what are the advantages to having one in advance? And what are the advantages of having them on the plot? So the first advantage to deciding the point of stasis in advance is research. If I told you we want to have a debate in a year about the role of summer debate workshops and whether or not they're good or bad or not, what type of research could you do between now and that year? Yeah? Good, so first thing you can do is easily get anecdotal evidence by running survey, qualitative or quantitative, to talk to people who have been to the summer workshops, right? You can do that between now and a year. You come up with some data, that'd be great. What else could you do? I saw the hand. Yeah. Same thing? Okay, what else could you do? Yeah. Okay, good. You can try to get real nitty gritty and some stats. Hopefully there are some. For instance, you need to be able to make some analogies to other academic institutions that take place over the summer that also involve competition. You can get into some pedagogy theory about whether or not the actual notion of an immersive experience is net positive or negative for students. There's tons of things you could do to research the pedagogy, theory, practice, statistics of what debate workshops are, right? You could do that. 
between now and a year from now. That's the advantage of deciding the point of stasis for the debate. If I said to you right now, let's have a debate, somebody on the stage, I'm going to workshops bad, you may or may not have access to the ability to do that in your limited prep time you have in a given moment. Second major advantage is organization. Let's say you did do the research, or you just have a pretty good amount of research already done on the question. If I said to you, let's debate right now, that's a way different set of organizational patterns than if I said we're going to debate in a year. The reason why we have a lecture like the awesome one that we have from Andres is, he's showing you that if you're going to have a year's worth of research, there has to be a year's worth of organization. Because if you just had one big word document with all the ebb from the year, and the way you debated was with control F. And you just sat there with a big word document open, just waiting for the other team to say something. Control F, jumping into the speech file, ready to go. Not only would it crash most of your computers, but it would be a terrible organizational pattern, terrible organizational scheme. But if I told you we're going to have a debate over how good workshops are, you have 20 minutes to cut cards, it would be OK in those 20 minutes to have a simple Word document with a letter every found, quickly organizing it, because it's not going to be the same type of debate. You're not going to be reading cards to your blue in the face, because there's a difference in when the point of stasis has been established. Third, the depth of argument. If I told you I wanted to debate with you about the oceans before the NFL topic had been created, it's not that you'd be a complete idiot. You would be able to have a conversation about the oceans based on your general knowledge, based on some past debate topics. You would know the script of how some arguments are organized, even though you may not know the particulars. And so you would be able to have a debate. But if I tell you at the end of the summer workshop, I want to have the same exact debate, the depth of argumentation I do is going to be way better. Because as a result of the immersive educational experience you're getting, you are now prepared to answer questions that you would not otherwise be able to answer about the oceans because the point of stasis has been decided and the debate takes place after you've had a chance to do more understanding and knowledge of the arguments. Now, I want to make sure that we don't just think this is about research. Sometimes it is about research. Sometimes this is about knowing more. Sometimes this is about actually debating the topic and knowing a contingent truth about what you think the direction of a question is in a given moment. So, for instance, does anyone think they can defend, based off Andre's lecture yesterday, the state of fishing, global fishing? How would you defend that? What would you say? Sure. Rampant overfishing. Then we have rampant overfishing now, OK? If you had done the research, you might come to the conclusion that there's rampant overfishing now. But what debate argument, and one that Andre's mentioned, what debate argument do we use when someone is controlling the direction of your needs? So if we're controlling the direction of the meetings and Alex is correct, overfishing is rampant now and happening now, how do debaters push back when they're debating someone that says that, that I'm controlling the direction of meetings? I have all the cards on my side. What would you do to push back against that claim? No. Okay, good. So you would either say the unique is overwhelms what you think you can do about it. It's so bad, it's inevitable. Or what would you do instead? Yeah. Good. You would offer another solution to fix the problem. All right, does everybody follow this? So simply doing research and knowing like what's the stats on overfishing is helpful. But argumentative depth is learning how to reconcile the research. What did you find out now? Change the strategy based on it. Does everybody follow that? And you can't do that if the first time you debate something is walking on the stage. If the first time you debate workshops good, bad, then your ability in the moment to say counter plan, we shouldn't do workshops, we should do one day workshops at home, Counter plan, instead of using workshops, we should do uh, Skype so we don't have to deal with the mental health issues of people will have to travel across the country and deal with the problems that take place at workshops. You see what I'm doing? I could do that if I had the research and more time to think through the debate. But if I said if you went down to the front of the stage and do it now, you're basically left with my offense, your offense, what do we got? And the beauty of debate is you do the research so you can add that depth to it. So you can do something different than you otherwise would have. Disadvantages, though. This is the trick. Most people only think about it in terms of advantages. There are disadvantages to picking a point of stasis so far in advance. The first disadvantage is argument creativity. I'm going to show you why. This is the resolution, an ocean, I'm sorry, space resolution, that was debated in high school in 1990 and 1991. For those of you all that actually debated and approached on it, and I think we have some people here in the May, okay? Shante, what's different about this resolution now as it's on the board versus when it was released? Do you remember? Yeah, the addition of the young uh, Yes. 
So when the resolution was initially announced, researched at summer debate workshops, almost all the way until the first term of the year, the resolution did not have the phrase beyond Earth's mesosphere. It just stopped at exploration. Okay? Someone be creative. Why did they need to add beyond the Earth's mesosphere? Because space is all over, like a couple feet in the air. Space. Boom! Because space exists in so many other places. For instance, in ocean affirmative, which is exploring the space of the bottom end of the ocean that hasn't been there before, might be teeth. These teams were using argument creativity to summer debate workshops to explore all kinds of cool understandings of space. And of course, the topic would be when they finally got word of this and realized that the mistake that they had not specified enough in order to reduce a little bit of that creativity, in order to ensure the debates were a little bit more predictable, added to the end of the resolution, after it had been released, months after it had been released, added the phrase beyond the Earth's mesosphere in the attempt to say, no, we don't want you debating, like, is there a core of the Earth or not? Is it full of dinosaurs? We want you debating what's going on outside in space. So we want you to go beyond the Earth's mesosphere. Did everybody see that? But if we decide in the moment, come down front, let's have a debate, some of the debate workshops, good, bad, your argument creativity is allowed to be way more developed in that moment. So somebody think of an argument for why debate workshops are good that you think is a little creative. Try to give you a defense of it that's not based in education. Try to give you a defense of it that's not based in teaching you something about skills. Yeah. Boom. What debate workshops really do is create a community. That at the end of the day, when we go to tournaments nowadays, tournaments are an entirely different experience than they were 50 or 40 years ago. Do you know that at the Wake Forest College Tournament, I'm not lying to you, at the Wake Forest College Tournament in the 50s, they all went to see a theater show together at the end of the first day? The tournament came, and they went downtown, had dinner together, and then went to see a show put on by the local theater. Together, as a tournament. Then they went home to the hotel, then they made it against each other the next day. That was un it's inconceivable that you would go to a tournament now, and the tournament would structure an entire social environment for the whole tournament to be in. But we've sacrificed all that social aspect in the name of training you, and that in order to get the most rigorous educational training to do that, we've made the day as long as possible. The debates as long as possible. We give the judges as long as possible to decide. And then when it's over with, we cram Wendy's down your throat and put you in bed and say, get ready to do it again for three more days. The social aspects of the activity are non-existent in tournaments. It happens right here. And so the real benefit of some of the debate workshops may have nothing to do with whether or not we teach you anything about debate. It's that we got 375 raging dorks in a room that otherwise wouldn't have a chance to hang out with anybody during the summer, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That argument creativity by itself, I like. But if I told you in a year from now, we're going to have a debate about workshops, good, bad, and you stood up and said, my major advantage is community cohesion, why is that less strategic? Why is that a problem if I said a year from now we're going to debate that? What's the neck likely to have between now and a year from now? Not only a block of interest to it, but Something that most judges would agree with a more pertinent problem, issue, advantage, whatever it is. The point I'm getting at is that you lose creativity when you engage in a set of literature because at that point in time the expectation becomes that the literature helps dictate what is and is not the relevant, what are and are not the relevant questions for the controversy at hand. Does everybody follow that? The creativity is lost, which is why if any of y'all have ever done a parliamentary debate before, or if any of y'all have ever seen a parliamentary debate before, they get the resolution 15 minutes before the debate. They're not allowed to take a single piece of evidence within the end of the debate. In fact, they're not allowed to cite a piece of evidence or statistic that is not known by the common person. So we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that type of life, that type of debate. One of the results of that is that the British win all the damn time because they're just really good at being creative with words. They're really good at saying, well, the resolution says space. It doesn't really say beyond the mesosphere. So rather than us defending the like, big stick part of the topic, let's defend something creative and interesting in these 15 minutes. And it takes the other team totally off guard. Does that make sense? So one of the things that we lose whenever we decide a year in advance, now that doesn't mean that there isn't argument creativity in debate. I'm not trying to say that. I'm saying it's devalued. Second of all, it devalues general knowledge. For those of you all that know, the greatest Jeopardy champion of all time, Ken Jennings, sitting there with Al Trebek, would be a terrible debater. 
if we just marched him into a room and said, get ready to debate. He knows an immense amount of stuff about a lot of stuff. But does he know the intricacies of OTAC? Probably not. Is he prepared to defend the intricacies of offshore wind? Probably not. We don't reward you for your general knowledge in debate. We don't let you stand in grandstand in the process to talk about the history and theory of particular things. As a general rule, we want you to be experts in a broad set of information, but really experts in the areas that you choose to debate, like what your are is, what your main positions are. So it's tough to be in debate and be a person that has a widespread general knowledge. It doesn't mean it can't help you. Of course it can help you. It just means that if you stand up and say, I remember from my AP US history class, that it was not, in fact, economic decline that caused World War II, right? Hopefully you all know. It's, like, it's a real honest to God fight about this. And there's a lot of people who say World War II is not actually the result of economic decline. But if you say that, and the other person rolls in with a two-page long card explaining why the opposite <coughs> of literature is true, your general knowledge is not going to be rewarded in the moment when put in comparison to a piece of evidence. Third, it devalues personal experience. If I told you right now, let's have a debate on workshop, good or bad. The initial set of arguments you can make are from your personal experience, and they're totally legitimate in this moment. If I said, come forward on the stage, why are workshops good? You could say out loud, a workshop is my only opportunity. I don't have a coach at home. A workshop is my opportunity to meet friends. I come from a public high school in Shreveport, Louisiana. There aren't a lot of dorky people there. A workshop is an important experience for me to get a chance to introduce myself to college people so the off chance I can impress them enough to get a scholarship. Right? You can make those arguments from your personal perspective because there's no early point of stasis at all. If I said to you, a year from now we have a debate about workshops, good, bad, and all of your arguments are from your personal experience, you're going to get crushed by the other side, quantitative, statistics, <coughs> anecdotal, qualitative, all the stuff we talked about before, you'll be able to research in that year. Does that make sense? So deciding in the moment we're going to have a debate, your personal experience matters way more than pushing the point of stasis further and further out. The further out it is, the very little regard for what your personal experience is, because it's just not representative at that point in time. There's an expectation that it will be. All right, so if I follow these advantages and disadvantages, okay. Resolutions are supposed to be the compromise. Why? Well, because resolutions are supposed to be propositions written against to guide the point of stasis in a debate. Rather than you showing up at a tournament, getting a pairing, and then walking into the room and saying, what are we going to debate about today? And then talking to your opponent and coming up with a point of stasis in the moment, which is dangerous because you don't know if they really prepared for this point of stasis for a year, or if they're like, yeah, you know, workshops. Y'all do a workshop? Why don't we just have a workshop good bang? Sounds like fun? Yeah, okay, sounds like fun. <laughs> this became such a controversy in the debate community, who got to write a resolution, that we actually have entire organizations now that script the resolutions for better and for worse. In high school, it's now done by what used to be the NFL, or the National Speech and Debate Association. For any of y'all that have ever seen how those votes go down, sometimes, I mean, sometimes high school football coaches have just as much say in what you're going to debate next year as the actual debate coach does, because at that school, that's the person who has the ability to make that decision as it relates to their state and how their state casts a particular vote. At the college level, in CEDA, which is our governing organization that writes the resolution every summer, we have a process that's gotten better and better over time, but our process is chosen by the papers that people in college write and send to the committee, right? Sort of like the NFL in that regard. So if we happen to have really good arguments and good papers and a good year, awesome. If like three or four people submit controversy areas and none of them are very good, that's all we got. Now, what I want us to take a moment of pause and have a quick discussion. What makes a good resolution? Knowing now what the advantages and disadvantages of the points of stasis in advance are. A, a resolution is a point of stasis decided in advance. But in order for it to recover from the disadvantages we outlined, what does the resolution need to do? How can it be a compromise? How can it allow creativity? How can it allow people to have a personal experience? How can it allow for people to have a general knowledge? 
Well, uh, equal distribution of app and my graph. Okay, ideally, you want to have a resolution that in some way, shape, or form is an equal distribution of graphs. Now, I, I do want to take a moment and realize though, that's a, what standard you use to figure that out is totally subjective. It's not like there's a random database we can punch in oceans. Is it equally divided on the controversy, positive or negative? It's a total subjective judgment call on the part of the people who are writing the topic paper about whether or not something is good or bad in terms of the graph. And here's what's so great about this. This is what happens in college every year. Someone will say, let's do the resolution this way. And the other person will say, no, how could you do that? The neg will have nothing to say. And no one has actually researched either of those things. It's total, complete, subjective. The neg will have nothing to say. And sometimes the other side is like, no, no, no. The neg always has something to say. <laughs> total limbo at that point in time. Does that make sense? That can be a deadly thing. All right, so ideally, it's divided. What else is a good resolution to do? Yeah. Okay, good. It's got to be broad, right? You're going to get bored two tiers. If the only if it was resolved offshore wind, like don't get me wrong, it's a fun app, and some people here might read it the whole entire year. But if that's all you have, you're going to get bored two tiers. So ideally, it's broad enough to allow some creativity and narrow enough to allow some predictability. And that balance, broad enough to allow creativity, narrow enough to allow predictability, that balance is what you all are fighting about week in and week in now. All right, so to show you all a little bit about why I think oftentimes people don't know a whole lot about resolutions, let's look at some fun resolutions from the past. Look at those high school topics. Imagine if you had debated in 1948-49 that a federal world government should be established. It's not a USFG actor. Imagine if you were debated by, in 1964 65, that nuclear weapons should be controlled by an international organization. No spec on which one, no spec on how it happens. Imagine if you were debated, I love that 1940 41 one, the power of the Fed Gov should just be increased. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you in the debates with a very strict, what we're going to call in the moment, case study understanding of debate, believe the debate has always been in the current instantiation of the convention of a USFG should. There's just tons of history that says that's not the case. They debated an entire year. Do you want to see something crazy? I'm going to show you the college topic in a moment. No, it, it's on there, all right, ready? Look at the 5051. Who's the actor in 1950 and 1951? <laughs> We the people! <laughs> you get to fee out the people on the air! <laughs> We've had resolutions that didn't even include the United States federal government in it before. So the assumption that if it's not USFG, we're not getting any education, Judge, it doesn't bear out. That's not what debate has always been. How about this one from college? Separate resolutions for men and women. <laughs> oh, no. Somebody do an historical analysis here and explain to me, based on the differences, why they would assume that these need to be separate resolutions. What gender stereotype do you think they were pointing to when they created separate resolutions? No, hand or stretch? Okay. Go for it. Check. And the assumption was, if you look at the resolutions, that women would be way more interested in debating about marriage and divorce law than they would about a constitutional amendment, which is probably above their heads when it came to child labor. Separate resolution. Yeah. Absolutely. We're at the height of whether or not women have the right to vote. The fight is still happening, it's still brewing, even though we have the op opportunity of actually having constitutional amendments. We're having fights about whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. All taking place, manifesting itself in the victory. What else, Jerry? Their maternal instinct would be so strong they couldn't be negative on that resolution. Remember, at this point in time, men and women, by and 